he had a front row seat to some of this country's biggest battles, repatriating the Constitution, free trade, pipeline politics, and more. For 5,270 days, that's more than 14 years for those doing the math, Ian Waddell was an NDP MP from British Columbia championing progressive politics in Ottawa. He went on to become a member of provincial parliament in BC. He reflects on those days and more in Take the Torch, a political memoir. And Ian Waddell joins us now for more welcome. Well, it's great to be here. It's a famous <laughs> show. <so I'm... laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you here yeah. because your book is so fascinating. You've been a part of so many historical moments um, in Canada and the world. Wow. Um, it, like after you, after you wrote this memoir, did you step back and say, did I do all that? Yeah, it's kind of interesting when you kind of look at your life, you know. But writing a memoir is kind of therapeutic, you know. I wrote it in different places. At one point, I was even near an apartment near Times Square, and I'm sitting writing my memoir. <laughs> it, so, so it took many years, and, but it, it's a chance to look back on your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized that, you know, I, 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 I got the idea mm -hmm. from a friend of mine. Who was with, we worked on the Olympics in Vancouver. His name was Rick Antonson. He was head of Tourism BC. And he said, you know, you should write like George Bush book. And I said, George Bush? I, I, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to, you know, emulate him. He said, no, no, he wrote about the 10 big decisions he made in his life. Mm -hmm. For example, choosing Cheney as his vice president running mate and, and why. And he said, you and I, Rick said, you and I would read that. We wouldn't read I was born in Waco, Texas or whatever, you know. <laughs> And so I thought, okay, so I took six instances mm -hmm. in my life where change was made, where I was either a big part, often just a small part mm -hmm. of change. And, and, and I went through those six instances mm -hmm. and, and that kind of reflected, God, it reflected 50 years. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get through all six, <laughs> but we'll get to some of it. Um, so before you got directly involved in politics, uh, you were actually a lawyer and you worked with Judge Thomas Berger, who would have a significant impact on your career. Um, tell us about how you met him. Can, can I go back a bit? Yeah, would you, of would course. Would you forgive me? Because it's, it's important. Yeah. I live in... Vancouver, British Columbia, and a lot of people there never admit it, but they come from Toronto, right? <laughs> You're from Scarborough, right? Toronto. Yeah. Well, what happened was, and it's in the book, there's a great picture. I arrived mm -hmm. in November the 15th, a week before the Santa Claus Parade, 1947. Five years old? Five years old, five years, with a little kilt. From Scotland? And I, from, and I had a Scottish accent. Yeah. My dad was an electrician, my mom was a waitress, and dad came first. And we then we pick, I remember the night kind of in my head. It was dark and it was snowy in Malton Airport. And I got taken away to Scarborough to a basement apartment, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, 14 years later, I was a second year law student at, at uh, not law student, second year art student at uh, University of Toronto. And I went out to pick up Lester B. Pearson mm -hmm. at Malton Airport, which is now named after him. You were his driver. I was his driver. Yeah. And, and I couldn't, I was 19, I couldn't vote, because you had to be 21. I couldn't legally drink, and I didn't, you had to be 21. And here I'm sitting next to a man who won the Nobel Prize, and he was fantastic. Mm. And I was so lucky. And I, I, in the book, too, you mentioned that he treated you just as if you yeah. were anybody else. He didn't treat you less yeah. than. This is the guy for your younger viewers yeah. who brought in the Canadian flag, who brought in the National Medicare. I think has been underrated mm. as a prime minister. And, of course, he brought... Pierre Trudeau mm -hmm. in from Quebec to succeed him, mm -hmm. and that uh, that was important <laughs> too. Now, what were you asking me about DC? <laughs> well, Judge Thomas Berger uh, played yes. a huge. Uh, he played a, sig a significant yeah, role yeah. in your life. I think How did you meet him? I met him. I was a storefront lawyer. I but I went out to BC after I finished. I, I was a graduate student at the London School of Economics. Very lucky. And I decided, what am I going to do? And I didn't like the Law Society of Ontario, a little too conservative for me. So I went out to BC, fell in love with the place, and got offered a job and article. And then I, I was going to come back here and be a big assistant to a liberal minister. The job fell through. Mm -hmm. And I ended up being a crown attorney, like a, a, a city prosecutor, you know, five impaired driving cases a day downtown east side in Vancouver, and then storefront lawyer after that. Mm -hmm. And as a storefront lawyer, I met Judge Berger uh, because I, he wanted some help. He was doing a family law commission, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a young judge. He had done one of the most famous legal cases 
uh, for the Nishka Indians that established Aboriginal law in Canada. So I knew about him, and I, I just went to see him. And, and, and then he called me up and he said, I think it was around 1974, and he said, come to my office, and there was a big pile of papers. And he said, I've just been appointed by Prime Minister Tr Pierre Trudeau mm -hmm. uh, to, to, do a pi to do an inquiry. And in those days, the largest construction project in world private world history, and it was to construct a pipeline from the north shore of Alaska, the north slope of Alaska, down to the across the north slope of the Yukon, down the Mackenzie uh, River, down to the lower 48, a gas pipeline uh, called the uh, the uh, Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, mm -hmm. and he was to look at the social, environmental, and economic impact of that pipeline, and he hired me to go, and I said. Uh, do we know anything about the North? <laughs> and you went up there? I went up there. It was. Mm. I've, I've learned. And one of the things that Berger said, mm. and I'll never forget, he, and he said it on, on television, which was we, we, we televised locally in the North. CBC did a great job then, mm. but it was before TVO. <laughs> yeah. and, it, and, and we televised in the South. So Southern Canadians saw the North. Mm -hmm. They saw people speaking in their own languages, five different languages. Speaking we, for themselves. Speaking for themselves before Judge Berger, who listened to them patiently. In what other ways was that inquiry groundbreaking? I think it was groundbreaking because, and this is relevant today, uh, because they, uh, the judge listened to people. He went out and he took the inquiry to them. He took Ottawa to them mm -hmm. and said, look, I'm Judge Berger, I'm going to hear you. We went to a town called Old Crow. It's still, Old Crow today is in the North Yukon. It still doesn't have a, a road into it. We flew up from Vancouver to Edmonton, and then we, we got to um, uh, Inuvik, and then we got a helicopter. We flew up the Mackenzie River right to, to the top of uh, the, the Beaufort Sea, mm -hmm. and we went down to a dew line station, and I've got pictures of it, and you could see the Arctic ice in the background. Now you couldn't. And we flew over the North Slope towards Alaska, and we saw animals. We saw the, the migrating caribou herd, and we saw the wolves. And then we flew over the British Mountains into the town of Old Crow. Mm -hmm. And we landed in the helicopter, and the chief and the head uh, man of the, sit, uh, the, uh, the town walked to this little strip. There was a landing strip just out of town to pick us up. And RCMP guy came with a truck to take us in. And the chief was going to walk in. And the, the RCMP young officer said, Judge, I'll drive you. He said, no. Uh, and Berger's father was RCMP. He said, no, I'll walk in with the chief. And you remember, in the North in those days, government officials would come in. And they'd leave. stay for half an hour, stay for half a day and go out. Yeah. And the judge, the judge had said to me, you know, and I was assistant, just a young 28 or something, you know, he says, uh, I've got kind of a sore uh, mm -hmm. stomach. And... Uh, I said, okay, judge, and we're walking in, and the chief said, oh, judge, my, my wife and I have prepared a caribou dinner for you. Uh, would you? And I'm going, uh, but sir, uh, yeah. judge, no, I'll certainly come to the caribou dinner. And the next morning, the judge said to me, he said, you know, Ian, we've seen kind of a miracle. We've seen, like, Africa, you know, the herds, the last remaining big herd, North America. And, and he's going to hear about the people and how a pipeline would affect them. And in our final report, we recommended that there be a pipeline, mm -hmm. a pipeline, but down the Mackenzie Delta. But we had to have land claims settled first, and that took a few years. Mm -hmm. And then no pipeline on the North Slope, between the North Slope of the Yukon into the Arctic Ocean. And today, that's a national, I'm very proud of that. Today it's a national park, two national parks, one ran by, run by Inuit and Parks Canada, which mm -hmm. we used to call them Eskimo, Inuit, and the other run by Dene, who are the native, who are the Aboriginal people around Old Crow and Parks Canada. So there are two national parks. That area is protected, and, and Trump is, wants to drill on the other side of the Alaska border. That know? must make you very proud, though, I'm to think that proud. you working on something so many decades ago still yeah. has um, impact on people. I now. want to go back and hike there. Yeah, well, maybe we can go together. <laughs> <Here> we go. <laughs> but how did working on the inquiry uh, shape your interest in dealing with indigenous issues in the political realm? Well, I saw Aboriginal people in a unique way. Remember, I grew up in, in Toronto. And I'm, the only Aboriginal people I saw was Lake Kuchiching. We used to go up the Rama, the reserve, reserve. We once drove through. I had no idea. 
And, and suddenly I'm going and seeing people living as, in many ways, as they used to live, hunting, fishing, trapping, but with a real strong culture and so on. But also the modern world, mm -hmm. you know, pipelines coming in there. So I got, a, I got to, to understand. Well, you mentioned that you worked in the opposition. Uh, you're an MP. Yeah. Um, what were some of the challenges of being uh, non-Indigenous um, in the opposition, championing indigenous, indigenous issues in the House of Commons? Well, I had to be careful. I mean, my writing was basically, I had a lot of, you know, I, I worked hard for Chinese Canadians. I worked hard on, mm -hmm. that's a whole other story in the book. Well, that's about how you became barbecued elected. Barbecued meats, yeah. that's yeah. how I got into China and all that. Yeah. And I worked for Indo-Canadians. Uh, which were really part of my riding in, in the east end of Vancouver, mm -hmm. Vancouver Kingsway. And I won that five times because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always had that in my mind from the Bridge Inquiry. See, the Bridge Inquiry was in the, the uh, mid-70s. Mm -hmm. our, our report was about 1978. And then I got elected to Parliament in 1979. And, and so the Constitution then... That's the whole story in the book, of course. The well, I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. uh, you referred to the work you did in 1980 in drafting Section 35 yes. for the Canadian Constitution as your proudest moment. Yeah. Um, could you read the version of Section 35 that you presented well, to then Justice Minister Jean Chrétien? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just give you a little bit of background. Mm -hmm. Can I? No? Oh, please. Um, so what happened was I get elected 79. I get re Trudeau uh, was defeated in 79. And, but the Joe Clark government was a minority, and it, it was very short-lived, and they were defeated in the House of Commons, and Trudeau came back. And I guess he, he you know, he, he, he read his obituary. This is Pierre Trudeau. Mm -hmm. he, read, he read his obituary, and he wanted to make it better. And he also wanted to bring, uh, bring Canada's Constitution home. It, you had to understand, at that time, the Constitution of Canada was the British mm -hmm. North America Act of 1867. And... and we wanted, you know, we, to be a fully independent country, you can't have a British act, you want to have a Canadian act. But the provinces, you know, they wouldn't agree and all that. And so when he got re-elected, or elected in 1980, Trudeau didn't have any seats west of Lloyd Axworthy in Winnipeg. It was all conservative and NDP seats. Mm -hmm. And we had a few seats. So Trudeau made a deal with the NDP. He wanted our support. And our leader, Ed Broadbent, bless him, mm -hmm. Ed, Ed Broadbent went and said, okay, you got our support. But we weren't too happy, but we didn't, we wanted a stronger mm -hmm. charter. We wanted women's rights, and we especially wanted Aboriginal rights, and some rights for the producing provinces in the You West. say we, but you were one of the people that was championing that. That's right, yeah. we meaning our NDP caucus, mm -hmm. you know, our members from Western Canada. Mm -hmm. We had a big fight with that, and a big, it was tough. Mm -hmm. And we even, I tell in the book, I won't go into it now, but mm -hmm. the British ambassador got even kicked out of Canada mm -hmm. be, because something he said to me. It was, it's hard to explain now to your listeners, mm -hmm. but I'll try, mm -hmm. or your viewers, I'll try. It was very intense. This was a really intense period. We were, you know, when you're writing a constitution, uh, for Canada, which will forever, uh, you have to pay attention and work mm -hmm. hard. Why did you want that? Why was that important to you as an individual? Well, I, I, I also go back a bit. I say at the beginning of the book about 1978, I'm up as a young lawyer uh, doing a case in northern BC, and I'm with Chief. We're fishing, mm -hmm. and there's logging trucks going through his reserve. They're going all over him. They, they even took his land. They... Uh, the government flooded a big lake there and there were trees popping up on his canoes. No kidding. It was terrible. And I said, well, Harry, his name was Harry Chinji. Harry, can't you do something? Can't you? He said, well, I don't have any power. I can't do it. And, and myself and another young lawyer said, you know, if we ever get a chance, and another guy, two of us got in the House of Commons in 1979. Mm -hmm. Jim Fulton was the other guy's name. And from Skeena, mm -hmm. Northern BC. And we said, we're going to do something. And you did something. And okay, yeah. here's the. So, what we did is, mm -hmm. in the constitutional document, we said, you got to put an Aboriginal rights amendment. You got to give, you got to give this. Uh, uh. So, the amendment read like this. And, and, and I have to tell you, as I say in the book, Judge Berger helped us. Mm -hmm. He said, keep it broad, keep it, keep it big, and the courts can interpret it later, but gives, give the rights in there. So it, it, my original draft said, the Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, then we put in, as they have been or may be defined by the courts. Well, we took that out later because, of course, it will be defined by the courts, are hereby recognized and affirmed. Simple. 
and can only be modified by amendment. Well, yeah, you got to amend the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So that was the clause that went in. And, and Jean Chrétien, we, we negotiated in uh, Ed Broadbent's office in the fifth floor of the center block of the Parliament buildings. I remember it well. I was pretty tired <laughs> yeah. when we were doing it. And, and uh, Jean Chrétien was the minister. He later became prime minister. But he said, I have to go. He spoke like this. I have to go and talk to my boss, which is Pierre Tr Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Mm. And he took the thing. And to their credit, to their credit, because they, were, they fought nationalism in Quebec, and it, they had trouble getting their head around. Mm -hmm. Well, why would Aboriginal people get special rights? Because it's in the law of Canada. It always has been there. It's always been in colonial law. And so we were reaffirming it in the Constitution. And, and it then passed mm -hmm. in the committee, it passed out. And then the provinces took it out. Mm -hmm. And that's when there was a huge movement across the country. It was Aboriginal people that came and got it back in the Constitution. They've added the word existing rights. But today, it's... Well, I think um, yeah. Harry Daniels, who was the president of the Métis National <laughs> <Yeah>. Council, <laughs> and MP Sven Robinson, uh, how did they contribute to Section well, 35? Well, well... Structure. Uh, 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 professors will say how, you know, constitutions are take long debate and it's all... Well, you know what happened? Uh -huh. we, we got the clause, the government agreed to it, we took it down to this joint committee, House and Senate, that was on the constitution. We had to submit it to the committee to, to amend the package. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and Harry Daniels was a Métis guy. That's, you know, half sort of non-native non native, and had big rings on and everything. And he was quite the character. And he grabs Chrétien literally by the the, 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 by the, by the collar, by the collar. <laughs> and he says, what about the Métis? And Sven Robinson's there, who was a bright guy, young guy. He was yeah. only, Sven was 28, 29. Sven writes, Aboriginal means Indian, uh, uh, Inuit, and Métis. Uh -huh. And they're in the Constitution. <laughs> Boy. Well, you said that that was your proudest moment. I, what is it about that that makes you proud to this day? Well, you remember I told you about Chief Chinji? Mm. Well, the trucks now can't go through his reserve. Now, I, don't, I didn't mean it, that they have a veto, that Aboriginal people have a veto, but they have a say. They have to be consulted. And we learned what consultation was for the Berger Inquiry. And, and I am convinced right now, now that there's a a revolution going on in Aboriginal, with Aboriginal people in Canada right now. You can see it, it's everywhere. Uh, you can see the, 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 you know, there's been the, the Commission on uh, Missing Women, the Commission on Reconciliation. You've seen the pipeline, you know, uh, 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 demonstrations. Uh, you've seen even uh, Aboriginal people it, buying in oil companies and working with them. You know, it's, it's, uh, you've seen an explosion of students. Law, you know, I, uh, somebody came up to me and said, oh, Mr. Woodall, I'm, I'm, I'm so-and-so. Mm -hmm. You spoke to my class. I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm an Aboriginal lawyer, a woman Aboriginal lawyer. It's everywhere, and that's good. Yeah. because we're going to get equality in the wrong. We've had Aboriginal people live like, like, like third world mm -hmm. here in Canada. And it's going to be bumpy. It's mm -hmm. not going to be an easy road. But I think we will get it. We will get a thing. And I was very lucky, I say, in the book. I mean, mm -hmm. I learned the, what they were fighting for mm -hmm. uh, by seeing the Berger inquiry. I learned what the law was, because Berger did the first case. Mm -hmm. In, in Aboriginal, the, the Nishka case it was called, mm -hmm. uh, and, and establishing that kind of law. And then we put Section 35 in there, and now there's been 300, 300 cases since then on that, defining it. What is the scope of that? How much do they have to be consulted? How much? But, but I think that gave them a legal basis for it. And the fact that you had a seat at the table and were yeah. able to play a role in affecting that change, I think, is really important. Yeah, I think that was... I went on to other things, then got defeated. Yeah, well, you went on to so, so many other things. And this is the thing. You've had such a fascinating life. And we only have a few more minutes uh, right. to uh, our, right, with our right, conversation. Right. But back in 2015, uh, you were one of the executive producers on a film that TVO right. actually helped fund, and yeah. it was called The Drop, yep. Why Young People Don't Vote. And yeah. we have a clip to show. Um, let's take a look. Change for the better, one practical step at a time. I devoured the daily news, trying to figure out which of the candidates I liked best. Who was looking out for me and my friends? Do we want taxes to go down? 
Do we want taxes to go up? How is he going to pay yeah, for yeah. $3 billion in out-of-control spending? I actually think but politicians always seem more interested in picking fights with one another than talking about the issues. What the Premier just said just isn't true. And so I know that just because the Premier repeats it all the time doesn't make it true. I understood why my fellow millennials could be so disillusioned by the voting process. But still, with student debt at an all-time high, the environment crumbling around us, and way fewer job prospects today than my parents had, shouldn't politics matter to my generation? I mean, we could change the conversation if we really wanted to. Um, why did you want to explore the question of why young people don't vote? Well, I kind of blundered into it, to be honest. I was retired from politics. I've been in federal, I've been a provincial cabinet minister. And, but I'd always been interested in film. I even made a film when I was a student at U of, U of T. And, and uh, I said to uh, some young people who had made a film about an 85-year-old woman from Saskatchewan, and they were young, I thought, you guys are good, so go and make a film. And, and I said, I'll give you a little money. And there was a by-election in uh, where I lived in Vancouver. And Christy Clark, who you see her on there, was the premier running against David Eby, who was quite a charismatic law young lawyer. And I said, here's, here's 500 bucks, make, make the film on uh, uh, what it's like an election, canvas organizer, the candidate, the phone bank and all, because most Canadians don't know how an election really works on the ground level. Mm -hmm. Well, they came back and they said, well, our, our young people are not voting. So make a movie about that. And then about $300,000 later, <laughs> and some help from TVO and CPAC and Rogers and, and things. And uh, we made the movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did you find through that process? Like, why weren't they voting? Well, there's another clip in there that you don't have, but and it was Dylan, this this our lead actor, who's gone on to be quite famous now. He's in Letter Kenny and all these sort of things. But he was just young then. He interviewed Justin Trudeau, mm -hmm. and and at the and, time the party leader. At the time, party third party. Mm -hmm. It was it was going into the election, and Trudeau kind of hit it. When he said, he said, well, it's not the fault of young people, it's the fault of politicians. They're not listening to young people, they're not talking about their issues and so on. Mm -hmm. And I started, we started seeing that. I mean, we went to, we went, we interviewed, we tried to get the Prime Minister, we got Mulcair, we got uh, Trudeau mm -hmm. in the House of Commons. We went to uh, Ferguson, Missouri, mm -hmm. and we had, we had some wonderful stuff in that. Well, there's an election, and, as you know, yes, <laughs> coming up, a federal yes. election. Um, are there things that party leaders should be considering in order to get young voters to take part in the next election? Yes, yeah. it's very important. I, I just should go back a little bit. On that 2015 election, that last federal election, the young people vote went, went up, and young people, and millennials, 18 to 24, went up from 36% to 50 percent. And great it, news. Yeah, and yeah. elected a majority government for one party. They got a good part of that vote. The young people didn't come out for Brexit, mm -hmm. even though they were, and the older people voted a certain way. In Hong Kong at an election, young people come out and they had an influence. They can have a big influence, but they got to participate and they got to vote. Mm -hmm. And and the politicians have got to kind of talk, talk to them. In my book, I I was tempted, you know, I would, I'll advance some policy and, and where I think on climate change and all. I thought, no, I just say the things that we did to make change, some of the issues that we dealt with, like nuclear weapons and things like that, and then say to them, well, here are some of your issues. I, you know, obviously climate change, cost of living, housing, you know, but you got to, you got to get involved. And I think that the, the movie on TVO had, had a good effect. Yeah. Um, is there, you know, back in the day, you were able, it seems like you were able to affect so much change. Is it possible now to do the same, um, to, I guess, to have that same kind of power and influence? Not at all. You have, you, but you have to, I, I say in the book, you have to have a number of, you have to bite some dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, if, what do they say, like, uh, dog bites man, no story, man bites dog. That's his story. So you gotta, you gotta grab, uh, issues. Uh, a good example was what we did with in Vancouver, what we did with nuclear. You know, during, when I was younger, I mean, still relevant now, but I don't think people know it so much, was the Cold War and the danger of nuclear war. And we put together, we, we just called for action. We got some people out. We went to a Pete Seeger concert. We held some signs up, said, hey, we're going to have a rally. 30,000 people showed up. And then we got 60, and then we got 100,000 to walk across the Burrard Street Bridge in Vancouver. And we didn't just, we had a concert. We had music, and we had fun. 
and we made it we made it fun. I mean, we made it attractive to young people, and they came out. Uh, did we have an influence? I'm not sure. I think we did on the peace movement. Mm -hmm. We went to New York. I talked about we had a million people marching, and and it was a movement, you know. And you've seen uh, movements in the past. The green, you know, the the environment movement, the the. Um, uh, peace movement, the gay movement, the the women's movement. You know, you have to you have to you have to grab these issues, engage, and, engage the people, yeah. and and kind of do it. You well, know? well, you're now chair of the Canadian Association of Former Parliamentarians Educational Fund yeah. Foundation. Um, will the youth vote be a focus of your work in your in this new role? Well, I, what we are is 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 former MPs and senators. You know, who are now either being defeated or retired, but we find that we have a lot in common, obviously, and we find we get along with each other a lot better, and 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 we've we've got we've got all this expertise on government, you know, and we're pretty non well we're very nonpartisan now, and so what we want to do is offer our services to students to young people. Can we help you? Can can you you know? Can we give you some of our advice and some of the things? That, but can we overall? We want you to participate and want you to vote. It doesn't matter which party you get involved in or what your issue is. You know, mm -hmm. there's conservative young people, there's socialist young people, there's all, all kinds. But we, our object is to try and get them involved. So I think we're going to try and do some interesting. Mm -hmm. We haven't got them all figured out yet. But uh, we'll go to schools, we'll go and talk to them, we'll engage them. I think that's and, really important because I think yeah. a lot of times for young people, they don't know where to go. So the fact that you're going to them is so wonderful. And we've run out of time. All right. <laughs> but, but I just, I say that, I yeah. say in the book yeah. that a lot of people think a lot of people are lazy or not. We found it was the smartest generation in human history mm -hmm. that they are dead. If you go about the right way, they will get involved. And what a life well lived. Um, it's right. such a great book. You even have a great story about Mick Jagger. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, that'll be the <laughs> Next program. That'll be the next program. <laughs> and the Queen, I'll tell you that one too. <laughs> thank you so much for being here and That's thank you for writing this. Okay, thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario and by viewers like you. Thank you.